with me. I've been back to back events. So I lost my voice. So she it, really did lose yeah. her voice. <laughs> um, we did a launch at, oh my God, this is terrible, at Dodger Stadium with our quesadilla tacos. Um, I think whispering might be better. Yeah, whispering's good. We can hear okay. you. Just, we'll be quiet. Do your thing. So we have this product called Adobo para Birria, which is, I'm sure you guys have heard, Birria has been trending. So we launched it at Dodger Stadium with Dodger's executive chef. And that's where I lost my voice. So <laughs> bear with me. We have a great group of gals today. So I'm really excited to introduce them. Chef Medito has been a brand for 40 years, built in Los Angeles. We primarily focus on specialty seasonings, marinades. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. And much more. Hi. <laughs> that was like the best icebreaker ever. Um, so I'm Kara Hutchinson. I know quite a few of you here, I think, um, over the years. I run the in-house hands-on keyboard strategic activation for programmatic at Bayer Consumer Health. Awesome. I can go next. I'm Courtney Redford, Digital Marketing Manager at Bridges Consumer Health Care, and we are a portfolio of consumer health and personal care brands, and this is my second time at a Media Insider Summit, and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to talk to you today. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sabrina Sirhal, and I'm the Senior Director of Media, uh, Digital Media at Monster Energy, um, and I manage everything from, uh, you know, brand uh, and awareness building all the way down to, uh, you know, basically the retail piece of it and point of purchase. Let's take a look at its past and the growth in retail and delivery retail media networks. Kara, you've been with Bayer for almost five years. Um, can you share a little bit about the landscape when you first joined in 2019? Sure, I've been thinking about this a lot, um, prepping for this. In 2019, I was really struggling to remember myself saying retail media together in 2019 and that didn't happen. There were retail media things going on in the organization, but it was largely the brand and the sales teams working directly with the retailers. Um, it was all about on property, owned and operated, uh, very nascent even, even then. Um, so it, it really wasn't a thing on the digital media team that runs national, which is the, the side of the business that I'm on. So it's no surprise that COVID-19 <laughs> uprooted previous industry norms and standards. We're a bit removed now. So what are some major changes to come from the pandemic, specifically the consumer health space? I believe all the gals can respond to this. So Sabrina, if you want to start, we'll go down the line. Yeah, um, I actually started shortly after COVID at Monster. Um, but it was an interesting time to start just because everything had been kind of upended by by COVID. Uh, there was, you know, you know, in the energy space, convenience retail is just such an important channel. Just because people will go in and grab an energy drink on their way to a construction site or on a road trip or, or something like that, and they'll try, 
you know, want a flavor for the first time, and then they'll go and, and maybe purchase more later. Um, during COVID, that wasn't happening as much. So it really forced us to shift the business so that we were doing more in the e-com space and doing more um, basically digital retail. So it, it was a great time that kind of forced us to do something we probably should have been doing all along. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have kind of a, a different perspective because I came from the pet industry and was at the pet industry or in the pet industry during COVID and there was like many industries this huge shift and this mad dash to go all digital and then when I joined Bridges um, two years ago, it was almost like phase two of COVID where everybody was able to go back into the pharmacy. So in-store traffic and brick and mortar was the primary focus. So there was kind of still this muscle that needed to be built and maintained of digital first, but in consumer health, there is still so much that happens in store and still the majority of our purchases are brick and mortar. So it was interesting because where a lot of industries, it was now digital is king. For me personally, in my experience, it was kind of opposite where I'm going from all digital and, and being the digital <laughs> marketing manager, it's interesting of having to focus on in-store traffic and brick and mortar sales. Do you want to tell us a little bit about any strategies that you might have used in order to help you create that drive to a brick and mortar? Yeah, yeah. So I, I you know, admittedly coming in and coming from the pet industry and then coming to consumer health, the word linear TV was something that I didn't think I would ever speak again. <laughs> like I, I was used to social and influencers and um, CTV and OLV and then you know, coming into consumer health, I was like, Lanier, who, who's watching that? But the reality is like, when you have an older demographic and you're trying to focus on broad reach, broad reach, large awareness and getting in-store foot traffic for these brands that are older brands with an older demographic, that's usually the channel that's going to be most effective, of course, paired with other tactics moving down the funnel. But you know, it's kind of like going back to basics of traditional media, which is the exact opposite of <laughs> what a lot of industries are doing. Yeah, you wouldn't expect that. I, I don't think I, that I haven't thought about in-store traffic as a separate distinct thing. Um, and when I was look when I was thinking about what was going on in 2019, I went through like 20, I don't, you should guys just see my notes, 2019, 2020, 21, 22, 23, 24, and that evolution of having not come from a CPG or been on the brand side before I came to Bear, really that mind shift of it is omni-channel and that feels so like duh for all of us to say, but if your media, if it's traditional or it's digital, is doing the right job, the right message at the right time to the right user, blah, blah, your in-store traffic is gonna, f is gonna follow. I, I think it's okay for me to say this. I don't care if they buy it online or if they buy it in the store. And I actually don't think the retailers now, the big ones, care about that either. Um, so I don't think about driving foot traffic. I think about driving traffic period. And if that's in your car, with your feet, if it's impulse, if it's planned, great. today's landscape and may any current challenges you are all facing with increasing economic and political pressures how are you balancing the need to maintain affordability with the desire to offer rich consumer experiences whoever wants to start can jump in yeah I, I can jump in here and I think as it relates to, to budget and affordability and trying to make your your advertising dollar go as far as it can I think you know, one area that, that we are definitely looking at, and this has been something that's kind of a trend for the past couple of years, but certainly in the last um, two years has been non-working media. So how can you take your production dollars and where you maybe you had previously invested in a really high quality production in LA and, you know, had celebrity talent, how can you leverage UGC content and influencer content and scrappy studios that, honestly, that's what the customer is engaging with more and, for the brands, it usually is a lot more affordable. So I think that's the biggest area in terms of looking at the total budget, how we're trying to, to make those dollars go as far as they can. The non-working is an, is an interesting thing to throw in there because as a programmatic person in the technology side and on activation, 
we get folks from finance and leadership coming for our non-working dollars all the time. <laughs> and I think at this point, we're like, we can't actually keep the lights on in this house without those non-working dollars. I think the efficiency play is important, and that's, that's, a, that's a difficult line to walk in the RMN space versus, you know, you know your business and your margin and what you can afford, what you can't afford. Um, yeah, I, th I think, I think we're going to touch upon this in a little bit, but the, the pressure part of it, after this five-year, four-year journey of this huge ramp up and huge evolution in RMN and in Ecom, which we think of a little bit separately, but um, it's about now, it's about us answering that with the right strategy for our brands that fits into what everybody wants. And that's actually not easy to make everybody at a table happy. So how do you ensure consumers are top of mind when developing your campaigns? Do you have any advice on how to navigate the growing demands of the industry while keeping the budget and recognizing team cap capabilities? And recognizing team capabilities. Um, because we're in-house, I'll go real, I'll try to be really quick. Um, it is, from an in-house perspective and activation, even if you have an agency running that, it is, a tweaked skill set to be really successful in RMN and Ecom. It's not like reinventing the wheel where programmatic is just maturing in the RMN space. That's not that's not it. It's training up to what those data those data sets are. It's understanding the bandwidth it takes to wor work in multiple partners. And then again, measurement is always something I want to talk about, so I won't start talking about that yet. Um, but measuring all those disparate data sets coming in. Um, it takes a, a, a lot of bandwidth. Can you repeat the first part of the question? Of course. How do you ensure consumers are at top of mind when developing your campaigns? So I can take that. I mean, I think sure. we let the consumer consumption habits directly impact the campaigns. And like going back to the example of linear, that's where our audience is consuming media. So that's where we're going to plan to invest dollars in terms of top of funnel, but as it relates to RMNs, it's where are they shopping and, and what stores is that? Because that's not gonna be all of them for all of our brands, and so it's, it's letting the data kind of decide and where the consumer is shopping decide where we invest. I, I could add really quick to that. I also, I think it's the, the retail partners themselves have a vested interest in our consumers having a rich experience. Um, and I think we're maybe getting to the point where those conversations are getting to that. I mean, if you look at s ad placement and what's available, even on owned and operated sites, there is pushback on the retailers internally of this platform is not designed to drive ad revenue, right? And how do you, how do, you do that and still give a consumer a good experience, right? And I, I think that's an interesting thing for them to figure out. Um. From our perspective, how we try to keep consumer, I mean, we're, we're tr looking at it across the board, but one thing that comes to mind right now is, is basically, again, connecting the brand to the retail piece of what we do. And a lot of times we go in um, from a brand perspective thinking we know who our target is and, oh, you know, our ultra zero sugar brand line is going to be this consumer and that's who we're going to target. And I think we try to let the data speak to us and, like, who is actually engaging with, with this product line, who, you know, it, sometimes it's like a really random audience that we would never think is gonna be interested in, in our product. And we are trying to take those cues and shift and, and per personalize what we're doing a bit more just to speak to that audience more directly. Yeah, I would say in that the retail space, for me, having my, my primary, f the majority of my time is focused on national media. When I say national, that's like non-retail, non-ecom, US, the whole, the, that whole world. Um, I love the quick feedback loop we get from the RMNs. Um, so if I have an idea to test in national, it's really easy for me to go to the e, you know, the e-com or the retail um, traders and say, hey, can you throw this into Amazon and give me a, a week and tell me what's going on in there? We have product launches. Some of them are e-com first launches. And that's like this huge, 
uh, like treasure of data on audience for us to scale that in national that we honestly wouldn't get. You don't get that with MCS, right? You don't get that with Oracle because household penetration isn't high enough. And so we had this opportunity to say, tell me what's going on in AMC world. Like, what do I do in national that to, to make this work? Can you share more about self-service RMNs and national media programmatic? And how do you complement or compete with one another? Sure, I, I think my New Year's resolution this year was probably something like spend more time with my family and figure out how to make national and retail <laughs> work together. Um, I, I, we have, and I don't think that we're alone, we have done a lot of duplicative competitive things in those two spaces because they have they've just been growing at this huge rate that we can't even keep up with, the retailers can't even keep up with it. But this year, it's like part of what I was saying before, it's on us to develop that strategy that is omni-channel. It's not Walmart's job to figure out our omni-channel strategy, right? And because we're not going to ever, if somebody has any insight in this, I'd love to hear it, happy hour. Will we ever get reach and frequency across all these partners? I think no, right? These are world gardens. And so we have to be very purposeful about our channel, right? Because it's not just programmatic and RMNs anymore. It's the whole full channel expans expansion. What's our audience strategy? What's our creative strategy? Um, how do we make those two things work together? Now, I have said this in the halls and through teams at Bear for probably six weeks at nauseum. And I'm never like, here's the answer. I'm like, guys, we have to make these work better together. Have guys, we have to make have these work better together. <laughs> have you found ways to do that? Um, I think we're getting close. all of these incompatible data sets that are coming at you now. <sighs> no, but. Yeah, mm, we're getting closer. Um, it is, this is not just a straight media play, right? This is salespeople at your, at your organization. This is brand managers at your organization. And they're not necessarily media people, right? So you have all these non-working dollar, ad server, blah, 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 data pass back. And then you have people who don't understand that ecosystem, just like I don't understand their ecosystem. Right, tell me how much an end cap is worth to you. I have no <coughs> clue how to tell you that value, right? That's mm -hmm. not my wheelhouse. But we're hopefully getting closer and I think we're hitting that level of there is no more money without incremental value. Um, so I heard this at another conference, I'm gonna steal and I'm not gonna credit her, but she was great. <laughs> she said every, <laughs> every yes, is a no to something else. And I, I think brands are really getting to that point. We talk about it out there. We have to start saying no to something and whatever that something is, is TBD. Yeah. I so can build a ahead. bit on what, yeah. oh, sorry. Um, I was just gonna say on our end, um, we're really trying to make a concerted effort to link what's happening on what we call it community commerce and, and basically connecting those dots. I think you know a big part of actually why my role was created was to try to bridge that gap. But it's it's difficult because it's not just about the media speaking to each other, it's really the silos that exist within, you know, in, within our teams. And you mentioned on your side, you've got the sales team, but for us, it's like each of our brand lines live separately. Each, you know, we've got uh, an e-com team, we've got, you know, digital team, we've got creative. So how do all these different people with different needs, how do we bring them together and have them speak the same language and, and cross share? So I think that's been the biggest challenge is just making sure, you know, a lot of times people will finalize a plan and just like, okay, well, this is my plan. And it's like, well, no, let's, let's try to connect it. How can the retail team extend what's happening with this? So, so for example, if we have uh, a big launch and, um, you know, a, a partnership as part of that, how do we extend that to retail? and try to bring, you know, make it more engaging that way. So that, that's how we're trying to connect the dots on our end. I want to I wanna open it up for, for questions. One, one more to follow up on this idea of incrementality because there do, when I talk to a lot of brands about um, their working in RMNs, one of the biggest questions is they're not entirely sure about attribution uh, because it, se it seems they're, not, they're, not, they're, not really sh they're really not sure. Um, whether what they're doing in the RMNs is actually, these, these are people who otherwise would have bought from them anyway. 
I think I, I'm really glad we're talking about measurement. So one of the questions we're not going to get to is like, what are the performance metrics? It's ROAS, 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 right? Um, I'm not super excited about Ro ROAS because we, we miss that incrementality piece of it. Are you standing in front of the door, slapping people going into the store and taking credit for them coming to shop? Right. But this is why I think we're going to get there. I get really excited about new to brand and I get really excited about new to category. Now, the activation piece of it has this wide gap because those are not metrics where we can apply AI or machine learning or what do you want, new buzzword you want to call it, into um, evolving that activation piece of it. But the new to brand and new to category, I think, are winners. I've been saying that, you know, in my, guys, we have to make them work together. I really like new to brand. I really like new to category. How's that going? And that's a slow mind change because it's not just me at the table with those retail media partners. How are you guys doing? I would say the same on our end. We're, we're looking to balance, um, you know, ROAS with new to brand. Uh, I think aside from that, just because, uh, you know, the RMNs are, you know, the, the offering is quite wide. So if we're looking at something like streaming TV and OLV and things like that, you know, some of the more brand focused metrics come into play and views and, and things like that. We, we do try to layer in brand lifts and sales lifts whenever we get a chance. But I think going back to what Kara said, it, it really is trying to make sure that we're efficient and then also effective in terms of bringing new people into the fold. Yeah, and I think it's just looking at it as a, f a full funnel. That's the reality is like RMNs, a lot of times if you're talking about sponsored, sponsored product placements, that's gonna be bottom of the funnel. So the way that you measure that and the performance of that is gonna be very different than if I'm doing a TikTok ad where I'm thinking about views and the click through and, and getting new people into the funnel. But um, to, to go back to Cara's point about overall allocation and having to say no, saying yes to somebody means saying no to somebody else, I would like to get at the, whole, the overall allocation picture here. Where is the money coming from? This is expensive stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, well, that's, that's what I want to know is, I mean, these, this is sort of the basic question that we had of digital 30 years ago is where is it coming from? Whose ox is getting gored here? So as you're thinking across this, this is very expensive media. Um, and getting more expensive all the time, where is it, where, what allocation decisions are you making already and where's the money coming from? I think we have a benefit, everybody has this benefit where programmatic is really, and it could just be my seat at the table too. Programmatic is one of those places where the RMNs are leaning into heavily and we have the chance to bring those a self-service which brings a whole nother set of challenges, a new set of team, it's headcount, all those things. Um, I think the money is coming from a variety of places, including the other side of the building, which I don't have a lot of interaction with, on how they, they spend their dollars in general, right? Like those budgets are owned by the brand. They come to us, um, you know, after 11 month planning cycles for the year after, so right, which is going into 2025 like, like everybody else right now. and where that money comes from, it's not always coming from media. Mm -hmm. That was. It's sometimes coming from other places that are, that are less effective or, you know, this is a greater need. Mm -hmm. How about you, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, I think going back to what I was talking about earlier around the creative piece of it, sometimes the, the non-working dollars, if you're able to cut costs there, then that can be reallocated elsewhere. But I think it's also just where is your consumer? Because yes, there are all these different channels and all these different retail media networks that you can go after, but if your consumer isn't shopping there, if they're not consuming there, you don't need to spend there. And, mm -hmm. and so it's saying no to some things, mm -hmm. dependent on the brand and the consumer. Um, I think on our side, it's <laughs> sometimes a contentious conversation because as you mentioned, it is a growing need and, and those budget demands keep, keep increasing. So. Uh, I think right now it's gotten to the point where it's like, what, which part of the funnel are we feeding? So if it is something that's leaning more brand heavy, we try to beg, borrow, and steal from the brand team to, to fund certain things. Whereas if it's more, you know, lower funnel, uh, conversion-based, we're, we're talking to retail teams, sales teams, wh whoever will be willing to kick some money in, and, and especially during key moments and periods of time. Sometimes, uh, you know, we, we find some interesting funding sources to, to try to help amplify things. Well, in a weird way, it's helping to break down silos that were already starting to crumble, but this actually is helping to push even more 
that does break me down in silos. Let's ha let's I'll shut up. Let let's have other other people ask questions. Hi, Lan for Unilever. A lot of things that you mentioned is so relevant to my day-to-day -day work. I'm, I'm from the brand side, not media. So Gio2, you know, Class Boy, a lot of things that I don't understand. But I, I think there's a trend right now for the senior leadership to be become more impatient. So a lot of the push has been like on lower funnel. You know, they want to see like how does that media dollar turn into like sales. And a lot of the brand that we have, that is not a D2C model. So you cannot see that because we are in like a lot of traditional stores. So that is like a struggle that we are having um, day to day, like, and from a classically trained brand profile like me, I believe in building brand. I believe in like building that upper funnel, but how do I protect my media money to where it can build the brands and not just translate into sales the next day? Um, we, we've actually been, um, I will totally come to you, Lever too, and chat with you guys as well. Um, <laughs> we've actually been the opposite. I think we're, we're, and I'm not making eye tact with some of the bear folks here because I will start laughing. We're the opposite where we have been very focused on getting our bottom funnel right. And it isn't, it isn't click-based and cookie attribution right. It's really the right formats, audience, timing, channels, all that kind of stuff. I think now for us, it's more about balancing the branding upper funnel piece because I honestly can't get away from the LinkedIn articles about CE CMOs and all those people rubbing elbows at cons are saying, we've gotten too far away from branding and we need to get back to that versus the short term. But then you get into the real real and it's quarterly numbers are coming out weekly and everyone starts to get nervous. So part of, part of it is, if, it, if I was in your shoes, it would be, what is that you have to find a lifetime value or some kind of value to the upper funnel? And that is incredibly hard. I don't, we're not there yet. And if you can link that to sales somewhere down, I do actually think that RMNs give us that opportunity. If we ever get access to play in that, that data the way we want to, you have so much flexibility on I care less about what happened yesterday. I care more about what happened over time. And I think that will build the case for upper funnel and also save lower funnel in some cases too. And I think it's demonstrating that too to senior leadership of trying to show them, you know, whether that is through showing your data over time, how it's moving, POS, and what activations you had going when, and just showing how everything is working together. and. It is a full funnel. It's not just activating one singular piece. We're going to continue this conversation in the roundtables at the end of the morning. But Lauren, panel, thank you so much. Thank you.